and thank you for introducing the title. So we, pre pre we prefer to, to, to prepare quite a lengthy talk instead of making free talk because we are anyway um, working together on, on uh, this, this part of multi-minute. So first I want, would like to introduce um, uh, what we aim to do. So, so today, uh, at the initial calculation, I think it's fair to say that they are still somewhat limited in time and space scale. So, so the number of atoms that you can include or the number of MD steps that you can afford to do for some computational costs is somewhere uh, still limited. And the, I would say established state of the art to go larger, to, to have more atoms or make longer simulation times is to use uh, effect, well, uh, empirical potentials or reactive, they're called reactive force fields or come in many different names, but they're somewhat empirical in the sense that yeah, you have a functional form with some parameters and you are just parameters to reproduce what you want more or less. And then on the other hand, I think there is a big research effort that has started something about 10 years ago um, to say, let's define effective potentials from ab initial data. And try to and by doing so, close the gap between uh, the effective potentials and uh, ab initial calculations. And that is going on the different names. I think you can say machine learned force fields for, uh, for under that uh, approach. And we call it second principles in the sense that it's going further than uh, first principles and it's an abstraction from uh, first principles. And so our approach to the problem is to say, okay, we have now some ab initio data, which I try to represent here in, in these crosses, which represent the born Oppenheimer surface, potential energy surface, that's just the output of an ab initio calculation independence of an, uh, uh, some perturbative factor Q. And we try to reproduce that by a polynomial fit. That's our take, take on it. And uh, Q today will be a uh, lattice distortion. So we include, we, we integrate out all the electrons and uh, only treat the lattice uh, effectively. So um, as we have a lengthy talk, we want to give just a, 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 an overview about what we will do. First, I will introduce how we define our model, how we define this polynomial expansion. Then uh, Louis will give uh, an introduction how to uh, sample effectively the born Oppenheimer potential energy surface in some in, in some specific cases. Um, that means how do we get these crosses in this first figure? How do we get the data? Then I will go to uh, show how we generate the expansion and how we make uh, perform the fit with respect to the data. And then we will show how we test and validate our model if it's physically physically reasonable. And finally, we show some predictions that we can can do with these models. Right. Okay, so let's start with the definition. So uh, as we make a perturbative approach, we fit something around the reference structure. And the reference structure for us is just uh, uh, a unit cell with, with a certain atomic structure and then we make we repeat it periodically so that and this structure we call R0. So we can get the position of each atom just by uh, the basis vector to uh, some um, cell within our simulation box. And then inside that cell, we have the motif of the original um, uh, reference. And then to get to any distorted structure, uh, we have basically two sets of parameters. We have on one hand, a homogeneous strain eta that is acting on the simulation box, so on the on the big unit cell here, and we have the atomic displacements of each atom inside that box in uh, Cartesian coordinates. And this is are the two parameters uh, that we use to develop um, the total energy. So the total energy is uh, for us just the energy of the reference structure plus three terms. The first one is the phonon term that depends only on the displacements, so only the views. Uh, this we split further into a harmonic and anharmonic part. Uh, then we have a strain term that only depends on the second parameter, the, uh, the, the strain. And then we have uh, the third term that is acting uh, that is coupling both together, strain and phonon uh, um, part. Now, for the harmonic parts, actually, uh, Abinit is very powerful because of his DFPT implementations. 
And so we extract the whole anamonic part from uh, typical uh, DFT calculation. And so we just, in Motivini, we ju you just give a DDB to, um, uh, to it, and you we get all the uh, interatomic force constants, elastic constants, and force response internal strength tensor. We extract them also, since we make use of the bond effective charges and the dielectric, tens uh, dielectric tensor to use the dipole dipole. Uh, to calculate that dipole interaction, and that's it. And the anharmonic part, this uh, we we fit to uh, some uh, generic um, DFD data. And that was it for the introduction. So now, what Louis will present is to show how we sample the bone open armor surface. And one can actually think of two scenarios. Either the reference around which we fit is a stable minima. So we have some, uh, uh, it's in its closed region, the lowest point of energy. And there it's quite easy you could say, okay, I just sample randomly around that structure and that will get all the information that I need. And you can randomly, it always depends. You can make different approaches, but what is more um, interesting, but also challenging, is if our reference structure is local maximum, so that we can reach the different minima around. And that is what Louis will present. And there, it's much more complicated to be sure to go into all the values, basically. And so that's what we will present today. So uh, we want to explore the bonoponema surface with uh, uh, which is which have uh, a lot of local minima to explore, and we don't have so, the clue about these uh, local minima, and so uh, um, Okay, sorry, uh, and uh, I will explain you how to generate and sample this complicated uh, energy landscape surface. And we start from uh, uh, a white page, and uh, we want to have clue uh, about uh, uh, where to explore this uh, energy landscape. And we have clue with DFPT and the phonon dispersion curve that you have uh, here. Um, this is the, the phonon dispersion curve of lead titanate. Uh, and you see that uh, in the cubic phase, there is several uh, instabilities that will lead to some uh, uh, local minima and the ground state. And uh, there is uh, three typical uh, instabilities. There is the uh, polar phase, the uh, plus tilt, and the uh, neg uh, negative tilt, which uh, are coupling together to uh, lead to uh, different uh, minima. And uh, we have the clue of where to explore the uh, uh, bonoper nemesis surface. Uh, to uh, uh, correct uh, the, the harmonic part with the good uh, anharmonicities. So we start with all these local minima and we can uh, relax all the instable phase uh, with the relaxation of uh, which is implemented in the uh, admit. And now, uh, we have to uh, uh, interpolate between the, uh, uh, the, the cubic phase and all these minima and all these minima together. And you see that uh, we, we do uh, the interpolation with uh, AGAT, uh, some linear uh, interpolation and some extrapolation we go after uh, the minima, and this lead to uh, uh, this uh, picture uh, where we uh, connect all uh, the minima together. And the command in Agat to do to do uh, uh, to do this is 
to bind, interpolate, and you can uh, interpolate with endpoints and with the amplitude you, you choose. Okay. Now we connect all these minima together and we want to have some information around uh, all these minima. And we can do so by uh, add some uh, uh, thermal noise by populating uh, the phonon and add some strain noise uh, to, uh, 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 to have uh, the more information to possible around all these minima. Uh, we can add some noise on the interpolation uh, as well to have maximum uh, information uh, before uh, uh, produce the model. Uh, to do so, you can uh, use AGAT, and uh, the command is thermal up, and you add noise on the trajectory. You can choose the random type. You can choose uh, uniform distribution or normal distribution. Um, you can uh, choose your statistic. You can uh, choose a classical statistic or the Bosenstein uh, statistic. You can choose the amplitude of the strain that you will add on uh, in the training set. You can uh, add uh, iso, tetra, or shear strain, and you can uh, choose the temperature uh, that you will add uh, on the structures. Okay, and you have this complete uh, training set where, uh, with all your minima where you, you add uh, the noise around the minima and you connect all the minima uh, together. Okay, and now you have a complete training set and you want to produce uh, a model which, uh, um, which will uh, um, uh, reproduce your training set and predict some uh, physics. And now my is can go. Okay. So now we go to the metal generation and fit. So first of all, speak about the anharmonic part and how we generate the expansion. Then we'll have a look at that. It's a very large linear system. And then I will show how we fit and select some important co coefficients from that system. And in the end, I will give a little out to how we might fit differently in the future. So first, in the introduction of the talk, uh, I showed the harmonic part. And now we want to, to reproduce the data that we have need to correct it with anharmonic parts for our three terms, uh, depending on distortion strain or both. So for the phonon anharmonic part, we write, um, instead of uh, products of displacements, we write products of differences of displacements to full uh, fulfill the acoustic sum rule. So here, if all uh, displacements are the same, if uh, all U's for all atoms are the same, so translate the crystal, all terms at third and fourth order will just uh, become zero. And that comes in the cost that here for third order term, we have now six atomic indices. So uh, the basis gets much larger, but we get um, we comply with the acoustic sum rule. On the strain, we don't have that problem. Uh, so we make just uh, products of um, uh, all the different strains. And by strain, in the strain phonic coupling, we combine just the both. So, so we make the products of differences of displacements times uh, the homogeneous strain. And now what is implemented in multimini is to use the system, the, the symmetries of the reference structure to group all these terms together so that uh, those that are uh, equivalent get uh, the same uh, coefficient. So for example, here in this, in this, um, in this uh, perovskite structure, you might have to determine uh, between the atom B and the atom X along the X direction. And then you can easily see it is the same then the, the one between uh, just the atom B and the atom X on the opposite side. And so we group them together. And the input that you need, need to give to multibini to uh, generate an expansion is the order. So typically we use three to four. Uh, the interaction range, and that means the maximum distance for the uh, displacement difference pairs, U, I, minus U, J. And uh, if you want to include anharmonic strain and strain forming coupling, and what would be the maximum order of strain in the strain point coupling? And so, in this figure here, you see the number of independent parameters 
depending on the uh, interaction range. So, and these are only the, the phonon terms, like four, uh, third and fourth order. And um, you see that in the unit is just the, the, um, uh, the unit cell size of the reference structure. So uh, a ref. And for um, this number of course grows quite, quite quickly. So for one unit cell, we are already close to a million. And so at one point you could say, because we have six atomic indices at third order, there might be some doubling. So uh, you could reduce, you can reduce the number of terms by uh, just using uh, terms in the form that I show here, where one atomic indice is re repeated in one in every um, in every uh, uh, factor. So that it's basically like what I show in the figure on the upper right side, drawing a circle around one atom and then adding shells. Okay, and so now we have a basis, and now we want to fit something. And what we what we get is basically if a system of linear equations, so B equals AX. And in the B vector, we have the difference between DFT minus harmonic. So it's just the anharmonic DFT plot. On the other side, we have the evaluation of the coefficients at each training set structure uh, times its coefficient. So here in the A matrix on the right hand side, the number, uh, the, the, the rows, and basically the number of training set um, um, configurations and the number of columns are the number of the terms that we have in the basis. So now, um, uh, and then we do that for energies and for forces, so we get the derivatives and the, for the stresses. So it's a really big matrix. Now. And the point is that our basis is way too large to de 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 determine all the coefficients. And that's not what we want, because we want a lightweight model to make uh, quick calculations. So the idea is that we have to select some important ones uh, and that reduce uh, that, that are pertinent for the most important interactions. And the uh, idea to do that, so that's what you want to minimize the difference between DFT and the model. And we want to minimize the number of non-zero coefficients. And the way to do that has been proposed uh, by uh, Carlos Escalera and Jorge Niguez in, in Luxembourg was to use a step forward uh, procedure. So we write a goal function. This here is just as a differences squared between energies, forces between model and uh, stresses, a uh, model and, and DFT, so for energy forces and stresses. And here we have some liberty also to include them or not if we want to fit. So you could only fit on forces, you could only fit on stresses, you could only fit on energy or both together, or you could put factors, put weights um, on different quantities. And so then what you do is we make the we generate the expansion, we get the set of terms, a set of p terms with the coefficients theta. And then we take all we fit all coefficients and even individually. Uh, just we just take one coefficient, we fit it, and we see how much we can reduce the goal function with just that one coefficient. And then we select the one that reduces the goal, goal function the most. And we keep that in the set, and then we add uh, all the other remaining coefficients to that first one, and we fit both together and see which, one, which set of two coefficients reduces the goal function the most, and then we select the second one. And then we do we continue and do that for the third and fourth and so on and so on. And then um, this is what what the fit look like, looks like. So we start from a weight pair value and we we select more and more coefficients. And at some point, it looks like it's converged or it's hardly hardly improving anymore. And the the, the choose for selecting these coefficients is purely numerical. And so a question that uh, arises is then when to stop and um, until now, we haven't found a numerical value yet, so a numerical criterion yet. So what you what we do is basically you can do then physical backward selection in the sense that you can go back and check does does your expansion reproduce um, uh, the, the does does the expansion reproduce uh, some physical quantities that you're interested in, or does it behave in a way that you want? Okay. Finally, we're also looking at different uh, ways to steer our algorithm. So basically, in the first place, we just went from atom to atom and select a few terms per atom. That's just a single loop that you see here. And then we found that 
if you do a double loop and say, okay, for each step, go to all atoms, fit the best, and then from those atoms, from those fits, we select the best one. So with double loop, we converge faster. And this we are still studying how how to steer the optimization of, of uh, the step forward algorithm. Now, another thing that um, we started to work on is to look at um, what is done in machine learning, because our problem is really similar to what people do with big data. So because we have just a huge basis with a lot of variables and a lot of data. And from this huge basis, we want to find the most pertinent coefficients and the most pertinent variables. And so one thing that is used is or one thing that's known as compressive sensing and um, techniques used in there. They are, they are um, using a code lasso or elastic net. And what they do is that they add a penalization term to the least squares operator. So here we have a term um, uh, that depends on the L1 norm of the solution vector. That means that it's just this absolute sum of all its entries. And so it penalizes um, uh, non-zero values in there, or it favors to be the most of the coefficients zero in there. And then you kind of elastic net is just a different formulation where you put uh, also the L2 norm of the solution vector. And another um, thing that we're looking at is to use correlations to check which term is correlated with the data to filter our basis before we fit, so to reduce the number of of terms that we include in the variable set before we uh, start the selection procedure. But that's uh, what we are, um, yeah, that's under development. <laughs> okay, and so now we can look at the validation part and that really takes over for a bit. Okay. Uh, so now uh, when the model is uh, produced, we want to, uh, to know how good uh, it is. And the first things to, uh, to look is how our model uh, reproduce the DFT calculation, which is in our training set. And so uh, uh, this is the, um, the sketch that I already uh, showed a few minutes ago, where we put um, a color on uh, the difference between our model, uh, the energy of uh, contained in our model, and uh, the DFT uh, in the, um, uh, the training set. And you can see that uh, the model of let Titan 8 reproduce quite well uh, the DFT calculation. Uh, all the points of the interpolation are uh, blue or uh, black, uh, which is uh, uh, a quite good re reproduction of the DFT calculation. And you have two uh, branches here, which is not uh, well reproduced because uh, it's very far in energy from uh, our reference structure. And uh, the anamonicities are quite large and it's uh, hard to reproduce these uh this uh, structure okay a second test that we can do is to um uh we'll take then the affected potential and relax uh pertinent phases so what louis was showing is basically checking how is the energy reproduced at the same data point now we impose a symmetry and we'll compare the relaxation between dft and the affected potential and so on the top of this figure you see uh the energies for number of phases in calcium titanate uh, for DFT and the effective potential. And in general, we make for the lower phases, we make uh, uh, overestimation of the stabilization energy, but the sequence of the phases is very reduced. And in the middle panel, you see um, the distortions that are associated to each of those phases. So the left bars are DFT, the right bars are the effective potential. And so it's basically the use that that's one of our values, a set of use. And you see that we are we quite performing quite well. And the lower panel is this train amplitudes. And there, um, with some exclusion, we're also performing quite well. So, so this with this result, we're really quite happy because we're really uh, with a few anamonic terms, with few tens of anamonic terms, we're already quite uh, close to what the DFT is, is telling us. 
And then the last test that we do is to recalculate the phonon dispersion around the crown state. So we have a local maximum that is the reference, and then we make a fit, and then somewhere lower there's a crown state, and there we want to calculate now the harmonic part, the harmonic or the phonon with the different frequencies. But the, the, um, our expansion will be dominated by the anharmonic terms. And so here you see the example for calcium titanate. And okay, it's a lot of spaghetti, but uh, if you look at the DOS, uh, it's, um, it's really quite good. So, so we, I mean, it's the second derivative of, of the potential. So, and we are really performing not that bad against, and against, um, against the DFT, DFPT. So with that result, we were also quite happy. And so now we have uh, a validated potential and we can try to do some predictions. And um, to start with a uh, quite simple <laughs> prediction, um, we perform a eating a curve of uh, late titanate. Uh, and uh, you see that uh, we have a critical temperature, which is here around uh, 530 uh, Kelvin, which is quite better than uh, the potential that, uh, that was produced in uh, 2013. Uh, and our uh, transition is first order because we have uh, discontinuity uh, at uh, TC and uh, it exhibits the good uh, uh, function uh, of uh, the polarization, which is T, uh, Tc minus T at the power of one quarter. Um, and it's in better agreement uh, with the experiment, which is here. Um, this curve uh, can be uh, made with agate. You do a heating at one temperature and you take the average with agate and then you can plot the polarization uh, Agat we uh, will read the Z star in the DDB and plot uh, the polarization against uh, the um, temperature. Okay, and we did the same thing for calcium titanate. Here, the, the, the um, structure is a bit different. Here, it's many the rotations that play roles, not the polarizations, and. Uh, here you see in the dots, uh, you see the, the data that is calculated or, or the yeah, data points calculated by the effective potential in the triangles by the experiment. And um, we find an additional intermediate phase between the PNMA ground state and the tech drug known E4MCM that experimentally is uh, said to be just uh, the, the only transition is happening in that temperature range. And so, uh, yeah, but at uh, the at this tetragonal transition, we are quite uh, well reproducing the augmentation of uh, one of these rotations. I don't want to go too much in details here, but uh, what is interesting is that uh, there has been a long debate if the intermediate phase uh, exists, and there has been a, su 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 a suggestion that uh, for such such a trans uh, transition uh, phase of the symmetry that we found should always exist. So it was theoretical paper. Um, however, also another question could be, because I'm quite confident now that this is what is basically imprinted in the, in the DFD data, is it a problem from the DFD? If you if, if would use a different function or would we find a different uh, sequence of transitions? Okay, and finally, something I, I've tried to be quick, but a bit more exciting. Um, we were contacted by Jean-Marc Frescon's group of uh, in Geneva. And they found something uh, intriguing. They grow uh, an autorhombic perovskite film on another autorhombic perovskite film where uh, the um, spe specific C axis in the substrate is in plane. And then the um, uh, thin film has two possibilities either it aligns its autorhombic to the long axis with the, with the substrate or it might make it orthogonal. And what they found is if the film is thick, um, if the film is very thin, the film adopts to the, the, the substrate. But if it becomes thick, um, 
it makes uh, the, uh, auto, uh, the, the long auto, orthogonal C axis out of plane, but there is some 10 unit cells with the in-plane axis preserved close to the, the uh, uh, interface. And the analysis was, okay, probably the, the C orthogonal phase is uh, favored elastically and, uh, uh, and there is some competition at the interface. So we tried to reproduce that with the second principles model. So I made a very long unit cell, uh, that is, but that is repeated periodically. And then um, I put uh, three, uh, three distinct uh, parts in there. So in, one, in, in the part one, I simulate the substrate in a sense. I uh, fix all the atomic positions and it saturate the distortions to be close to uh, that one of this person scan day. That was the, uh, the example that they had. And then in the part two, I put uh, this C parallel phase and let it free to relax and then free the C perpendicular phase. And now what I vary is the um, uh, thickness of this intermediate layer and the absolute layer. And so here you have a very thin film and I vary D from zero to um, the whole film. So the first, the first point means there's only phase three and the last point means there's only phase two. And so the lowest configuration is only phase two, only, uh, only C par uh, parallel like in the experiment. And then I start to increase the total thickness, the L, and then the, the uh, difference between this last point and this intermediate point becomes more and more smaller. And at some point, we find the total minimum. And um, uh, yes, and so we can, we can play this game further and further and further and further. And then we find that at some point there is uh, actually some combination of phase two and phase three favor. So um, you see here, that's the optimal value for V for small absolute thicknesses. The whole film is just phase two. At some point there's a mixture of both. And so we call it, even though if you just use calcium titanate, it's not at all lantanium vanadate in this protein scan date, but it's, which is structurally very similar, we can qualitatively reduce the, res, reduce it, uh, reproduce the result. And so we're very happy with that and hopefully uh, we'll publish it soon. And with that, I. Uh, we will close, I think. So a little summary. Uh, we have now an automated procedure to generate and fit polynomial expansions. Um, Louis developed a new uh, test set generation uh, strategy to help to, re to have a strategy of how to sample very complicated on open liner potential energy surfaces. And finally, we show that we can use these uh, potentials to um, a, a predict some finer temperature properties and use it in, in complicated uh, thin film cases, which would be probably too challenging to do it at initial. And for what we want to do in the near or further future, or, but more in the near one, is to implement, uh, to be able to combine different anharmonic parts in different parts of the simulation box so that we com can combine different materials and make even more realistic in, uh, simulations of uh, Something that I have just shown to you that you can have two materials and relax them. Then I mentioned that we have we were exploring new fitting strategies and uh, also what's on the table is to use these effective potentials with uh, spin models or electronic models to introduce spin uh, lattice or electron lattice couplings. Okay, with that, uh, we thank you very much, and we are waiting for your questions. Okay, so thank you very much for this combo presentation. And right now we have uh, only a few questions. So there is Mathieu as a question for Louis. And uh, when you compare the uh, critical temperature for lead titanates with respect to the experiments, he, uh, he, was, he was asking if it is correct to compare with experiments while you should be tending uh, to the ideal DFT TC rather than the experimental one. Is this correct? Uh, uh, si c'est pertinent de, de, de comparer avec ce moment, parce que personne n'a un laboratoire. Ah, uh, yes, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, yes, like Marcus said, it's a virtual uh, eating. Uh, 
but uh, if the uh, I think he said it on the on the next slide. Actually, uh, as soon as I asked, asked my question, yes, Marcus made comments about the exchange correlation. Do you have any feeling for how much this is going to change with the exchange correlation? Because we're all happy because it's getting closer to experiment, but um, and, and I believe that your model is better than than the previous one. But we we sh you you should have a an ultimate reference for where you should be tending to as the model gets perfect, and that's that's really yeah. hard to know whether you're above it, below it, or yes, I think uh, the the the. The limit is the, uh, is in the DFT. Uh, if you ch if you have a, 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 a for example, uh, if you take the LDA, if you do the same thing in LDA, the the, the critical temperature uh, will be uh, uh, low because the strain phonon uh, coupling is uh, uh, very low. And in I I use a PBSL in GGA. And the the strain phonon is uh, uh, very close to the experiment in at zero k. So mm -hmm. uh, I think when at zero k we are close to uh, uh, the experiment, we can convince convince ourselves that uh, it will tend to reproduce better the experiment. And when you compare with the previous. Uh, model was the previous model done with the same function or not? No, it was it was in LDA and they have to apply um, negative pressure to to reach uh, the, the the good uh, uh, A cell, uh, which is the same as the experiment exper experimental. And the TC you report here is the one with the extra pressure to compensate or not? Yes, yes. It's not uh, with the with the, the extra pressure. Ah, it's not. So it's uh, like is LDA, and in your case, it's PB. So that might yes, be yes, difference. It's not really a difference on the model by itself, maybe. But yes, be. but we 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 we, we if uh, for example, F, uh, we want to uh, to study the let titanate under pressure. Uh, we 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 don't they have to apply uh, uh, a pressure uh, uh, before uh, to to reach the, the good air cell so uh, i think if the the good air cell uh, uh, without uh, apply uh, some artifact is better yeah of course that's uh, that's really better Okay, so there is a second question by Xavier, and he's asking if the present implementation uh, seems to be tuned to perovskites, and uh, how general is is it really for the in the codes? Did you test for other type of crystal than perovskites? Uh, not yet. <laughs> to, to, be, to be fair, because we were developing testing, developing testing. I think. Um, Mm, to be blunt, I think we have still problems with let's say non non Cartesian unit cells. Everything that's from bohedral or face centered uh, 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 face centered unit cells, stuff like that. The basis is like this, where the uh, symmetry elements might be it's something else than one or zero one or one or zero. Um, this is not working at the moment, I think, but it's not. It's not so much perovskites as that it's uh, the Cartesian uh, property of the unit cell that's limiting. Right. So it should work for cubic, tetragonal, or tonic system. Yes, that should be fine. But but stuff like rhombohedral or mm. face centered uh, unit cells are a bit more complicated. Oh, so it won't work. <laughs> Okay, there is not much more question, but I have a question. If we go to maybe technical, but let's see, to slide 21, if you can. Okay. 
<laughs> well, if it's not possible, otherwise we can. I no, no, but what, what's the question? Tell me the question, we will figure out. Uh, the question uh, when you, you scan in the multi dimensional space, you have this cycle where you cross different phases and so on. And uh, I have here, yeah. This one? Oh, just after or before, I don't remember. I don't see the number of things. This one? Yes. And uh, so he is. is you scan a multi-dimensional space and here you project into 2D space that is circular, but uh, you have no guarantee that the di distance in the multi-dimensional space is the same as represented here in 2D. So why you say, when you mention you have some lines where the space is red and yellow is not good enough, maybe in the multi-dimensional space, the distance is much larger than that. Yeah, that's very possible. But I mean, that's basically what, what uh... I mean, what yes. Louis basically, <laughs> uh, what Louis said that in the sense these structures that are red here, mm. they're very high in energy compared to the reference. Yeah, okay. So they might be also very. I'm not sure what they are, but it might also be somewhat largely distorted. Yes, it's a barrier be between the the, uh, the rotation in an axis and two axes and. Um, uh, no, it's a polarization. Sorry, it's a, a polarization between one axis and a polarization between two axes, and the barrier between uh, the two are very uh, high in energy, mm. and then it's very uh, uh, far from our reference, and then uh, it's uh, uh, harder to reproduce it with our model. Well, it could be nice to to have a, a projection that on two D that respects the. The multi-dimensional distances. Mm. And, uh, <laughs> I don't know if you scan properly the, the space on that side. So it can be an idea. And then the, my last question is the at the end finally, uh, how many DFT uh, single point calculations do you need to get a converged uh, uh, model? For the many the cases you had here, let tightnet or cache tightnet. How many DFT data points do you need in your training sets? Yeah. How many do you have? Uh, around thousand. One thousand. Okay. So maybe. Yeah, I have a bit more, but I think in my training setters, I didn't apply this strategy. I think I could. I have five thousand, but I think I could do much with much less because there are many redundancies in my training set. Uh, okay.